recommendations to the General Assembly right. on the pension board issues. Right. And that commission, to my knowledge, uh, it's still kind of in their purview. Now, there's several representatives who are sitting on that, you know, so there's legislative participation. But um, until that comes to the House as an official proposal, we probably won't be out there banging pots and pans because the last thing you want to do is start setting up straw men that then get shot down and maybe aren't appropriate. Right. But I'll tell you my opinion on that. Um, just briefly, we ought to, I mean, I, I've always, I kind of believe this way about Social Security as well, and I really thought George Bush made a mistake when he came off this debate. I think it's when he started to lose the presidency. Um, I mean, he was already in his second term, but when he came off the real debate that everyone understood about Social Security, I think he missed it. Now, I don't think he was selling it very well, obviously, but you can't, in my opinion, you can't affect what people have worked for all their lives, that it's there, it's that golden egg at the end. I mean, if you're 65 and about to retire, um, we shouldn't be taken from your Social Security, whether it's whether it's pension envy or not. Right. That was part of the deal, um, to the extent we can. But as you move back towards my generation, those benefits have got to go away, and they, and that's I think that's how you solve the problem. And and you know what? Somebody's got to pay for it, and it shouldn't be the taxpayers bailing it back out the pension system. So that should not happen. And to your point, that's what would happen if we just come through and say employer, which would mean local government, has to kick in more, which I know will probably be one of the proposals. You're right, it's going to develop into just increased taxes. Um, but as you come down that cycle, you got to go to a defined contribution, not a defined benefit. you got to stop this defined benefit stuff. I mean, no one in the private sector hardly gets that anymore. Uh, and you got to go to a point where the, they're paying more of their own way. Um, again, I mean, most of us in the private sector don't, we don't get 14% automatically dumped into our uh, coffers just because well, one, one, thing, I, one thing I see is that there's no maximum benefit that is, has been established for any of those pension plans where if I'm in Social Security if I, if I make you know three hundred thousand dollars a year I am not going to collect 80 right. or 89 percent of my well, pension. Well you got the double dipping pension. issue where people are taken out for the pension and headed back in that's a problem you felt and the reality is look I mean I'm young but it, it always used to be said that of course you you went to work for the government and you got less pay and great benefits, and that's the reason you went to work for the government. I mean, outside of the public service sector, you know, the right. ideas. That's not true anymore. Now you get equal or better pay and great benefits. The system is broken in that it's not working. You've got a government that is that is um, comparatively speaking totally out of touch with what's happening on the ground. Um, you know, bluntly. We have not dealt with the pension and benefit issues as well as I'd like for us to. I think part of it is because it's very complicated and we haven't heard the final recommendation and all that stuff. But we have started talking about the salary issue. Um, House Bill 430 and House Bill 210, both of which I'm the original sponsors on. 210 was the one to cut our pay until the economy recovered. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say legislators make too much or too little. That's a different debate. What I wanted to do was align the policymakers with the economy. House Bill 430 would cut departmental total salaries, okay? Not, not individual employees, that's not my job as a legislator, but it would say, hey, Department of Transportation, if the economy you know, is going down, Ohio GDP is going down, you gotta go down too. Now, does that solve the problem? No, because we're already, we're already out of whack, but at least stops the problem from continuing to expand, because right. right now it's happening. We've got a government growing a whole lot quicker than the private sector is growing it. It's, it's out of line, it's out of touch. And so now, I mean, one of the things that got me in a lot of trouble with the city council was when I asked our HR department to come to me with a medium range, medium, sal medium salary. It was like 69, I don't remember what the number, one, the number was. It was big. It was big, and com when I compared it to the median household income per the census, it was totally out of line. And that was one of the hammers I used to go back to the council and say, enough's enough. We gotta, you know, we gotta cut taxes. We got, we gotta bring this back into line. And I, I'll say this as well. I, I believe that, you know, the idea of cutting revenue and forcing the government to do with less is, is, is probably the best strategy that that we have as a people and, frankly, as politicians to, to push. It is really, really, really tough to get any sort of government, Republican or Democrat, to cut spending. And and part of the issue to that is they don't. There's so much. There's so much pull on the other way. Okay, um, uh, you know, in Huber Heights, what ultimately led me to propose this tax decrease was that we had begged for efficiency for seven years. 
I, I mean, we had pounded on the table and jumped and danced and done all the things. And every time you'd get to a point, I, mean, I was a council member. Now I'm a legislator. I mean, I don't know what happens inside District 7's ODOT uh, shop. I don't know where the inefficiencies are. There's no way for me to know where the efficiencies are. And I guarantee if I walk in, what do you think they're going to be doing? They're not going to be playing solitaire on the computer. They're going to be working, okay? So every time I bring this up as a council member, well, what? council member, what do you want to do? Have houses burned down? I mean, what? Okay. I mean, right. you, you want cops, right? You, you want crooks? Right? Well, the reality was when we finally said, look, we've had it, and we just issued their proposal. We're going to cut taxes. We're going to, you know, we, it, was a, it was a complicated proposal. It had some juice for everybody in it, but at its core, it was a tax decrease. Um, once the bureaucrats figured out their goose had been cooked, uh, they found 8% of their GRF in 30 days without a bit of service delivery issue. I mean, they had it. They had it. They had it the whole time. And what we had to do was call the bluff. And that's frankly what we're going to have to do at the same time. So we need to use these crises that are building and go at it, to your point, from the expense side, not the revenue right. side, because the revenue side is just going to increase the burden on all of us. And use it as an opportunity to realign government and the private sector, because um, one is growing a whole lot quicker than the other, and it shouldn't be. Well, just a quick example. I'm in, I'm in Boy Scouts, and we went out to us, you know, the state park has this, the state parks have this thing, and if you want to do a service project for them, they'll let you camp there for the weekend for free. So we went out, and we, they had, um, this was a couple summers ago when gas was hitting four bucks a gallon, and we walked out there, and they had money in their budget to buy new carpeting and new office fixtures for their office. And the guy was telling us, he says, you know, I don't have enough money to even buy gas to mow right. the lawns for, for the summer. He says, my, my budget is so inflexible. They'll put, they'll, they'll, they'll gladly put $20,000 in my office account for me to buy carpeting and desk. Right. He says, but at the same time, I can't take that $20,000 and mow the grass. He says, I'll be, I'll be lucky if I can mow the grass at East Harbor State Park every three weeks. You know where the $20,000 probably came from? The capital budget, not right, those right, for sure, right, that's what which I mean. is separate money, right? Which gave the rep or the senator the opportunity to say, "Look what I did! I got you! I got you money for it." You're right. I, our priorities in Columbus are right. utterly out of whack. Yeah. It's not just Columbus. Yeah, no, just Columbus. but I can speak about Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the rest of you out in Washington, they just do crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, last chance for any questions. As I promised Seth and his wife that I would have them out of here by ten thirty. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I appreciate you all coming out today. And uh, sorry to put those of you that I put to sleep to sleep. And uh, beg for your support. Please go to SethMorgan.org. Um, we're going to win this primary, so I need you on SethMorgan.org anyway. I, it, let us capture your information if you're willing to help out. Um, if you can find a little penny or two to throw our way, that'd be great. But most importantly, uh, please tell your friends and neighbors. Uh, that's how we'll win this election. And that's how we'll do it in the fall as well. Uh, it's, it's the same. Uh, we like to raise money because that helps drive the message, and you got to do it. But at the end of the day, we've always won our elections through what I call creating the buzz, building the buzz. And the buzz is, if you believe in me, you start talking about it, and that's really what wins elections. So I really appreciate y'all coming out this morning. Uh, thank you for your time.